uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Now this uh, is a session on uh, Ibn Arabi's uh, Sheikh al-Akbar's metaphysics. Uh, obviously, this is not a, a detailed exposition of the Sheikh's uh, very complex and sophisticated metaphysics. It is just an et effort, an attempt on my part, a humble effort, to somehow uh, try to explain his metaphysics in as simple a manner as as is possible. So, yeah, uh, we may begin now. Uh, for uh, for for the Sheikh and for uh, his disciples, that is the entire Akbarian school. God uh, or being qua being, God is basically the reality of existence or being qua being. Okay, that is existence, in as much as it is existence. That is in as much as it is devoid and detached from everything that is other than the reality of existence or that diminishes or negates the reality of existence. So for Ibn Arabi, God or being qua being is the unconditioned existence or wujud labishart. Uh, he is also the reality of existence or asl al-haqiqat al-wujud that is absolutely devoid of every condition, every shart, including the condition of being unconditioned. Okay, At this station of divinity, that is unconditioned existence, there is neither a consideration or an etabar of a name, ism, or an attribute, uh, a sifa, nor does any description or definition apply thereto. Because at the plane of being qua being, all the names, attributes, descriptions, definitions, and relations are annihilated within the essence. Okay, hence the station of absolute existence or wujud al matlaq is beyond all names, attributes, relations, definitions, descriptions, and limitations. But this does not mean that the essence is devoid of its attributes of perfection and the plane of the essence, because the absence of consideration of a thing is not the same as the absence of that thing, okay? That is, uh, the adm aitabar is not adm okay? As to say uh, in Arabic. So uh, the reality of existence is therefore neither external nor mental. It is neither, you know, a substance nor an accident, okay? It is neither necessary nor contingent, okay? Now, this may... Uh, seem a bit strange, you know, to many of our listeners, that it is neither necessary nor contingent, but we, we would shed some light on this as we proceed further. It is neither numerically one nor a plurality, okay? It, that is, it is not wahid bil adad. The wahda of God, okay, or the wahdaniya of God is uh, not a numerical unity, okay? Uh, what kind of a unity it is, Okay, will be explained later, inshallah, hopefully, God willing. So it is not a substance because every substance is, you know, uh, of the order of quiddity. Uh, th that is, every substance is, since it is something contingent, so therefore its existence is distinct and separate from its quiddity. That is, its existence is accidental in relation to its quiddity. Okay, and it is therefore something delimited because to have a quiddity, uh, is to be delimited, okay? Because only only delimited things uh, possess quiddities. Therefore, substance being a higher genera uh, uh, basically defines or limits, delimits, you know, objects, things, or beings. The, uh, God cannot be, therefore, therefore God cannot be a substance. It cannot be an accident, uh, obviously. God cannot be an accident because every, uh, an, an accident is a quiddity, which when it exists in reality, it inheres, okay, within another, that other being, you know, the substrate or the subject or, you know, called uh, imodu in, uh, in Arabic. So now God is not dependent upon another. It is needless of everything, okay? Uh, as the Quran says itself, Ya yuhannasu antumul fuqrao ilallahi wallahu huwal ghaniyul hamid. So God cannot be an accident. He is needless of a substrate or a subject within which to inher 
for his concrete reality or existence or you know uh, existentiation uh, he is not uh, you know he's neither one nor a plurality obviously he's not a plurality that is pretty understandable but he, him not being one you know might you know sound confusing to certain listeners okay but when we say that he is not one okay he's ni- neither wahid nor kasir so the kind of uh, you know uh, wahid that is being negated over here from the reality of existence is the wahid bil adad because divine unity is not a numerical unity okay so uh, you know substances accidents uh, unity plurality okay wahda kasrat uh, wajib mumkin all these are distinct or different manifestations madahir of uh, you know of the of the of the one reality okay they are they are distinct theophanies or tajalliyat and identifications the tayyunat of being qua being or the reality of existence that in, encompasses them all okay so uh, he is foka hamaya uh, ashya you know god is above everything else he is qahar uh, above everything else okay uh huwa al wahid al qahar so when we say he is qahar or when we say that he is fawq uh, you know fawq kull shay what that means is that since he is the principle of every other reality so the cause of the existence the principle of a thing okay is above that thing it encompasses that thing okay it is it is uh, uh, it has ahata over that thing so uh the reality of existence encompasses all it encompasses both substances and accidents it, en- it encompasses uh, both pluralities and unities it en- it encompasses both the necessary and the contingent okay being denuded and detached from everything other than itself okay being qua being at the plane of the essence that is the maqam al dat is pure existence it is wujud e mahad okay the core of the essence or the kohna dat is absolutely ineffable it is inaccessible to everything and therefore eludes apprehension by both discursive reason as well as mystical insight the, the shahood and spiritual disclosure or kashf and is thus appropriately named the occidental phoenix or the anqai maghrib the hidden treasure the kind the maghfi and the ghaib al ghuyub due to its ineffability okay and the inapplicability of the consideration of the names and attributes the essence at the plane of the essence may only be referred to as he or huwa in arabic the ineffability of the essence is best expressed by amir al mu'minin imam ali alayhi salam in the following words from dua al mashlul i'm going to you know uh, just state the translation o oh, he huwa whom none knows what he is okay so this is a very famous statement of the imam from uh, dua mashlul okay which is which is a very uh, beautiful uh, supplication of the imam it is it is full of you know mystical uh, insight and uh, you know uh, it, it's brilliant it's a brilliant supplication the first identification or the tayyuna awwal and uh, and theophany the tajalliya awwal of the essence the zat occurs due to self love okay because the essence the divine essence it knows itself okay and it not only knows itself but it knows itself or apprehends itself as the principle of every good okay and every perfection and obviously the principle of every good and every perfection that is every contingent good and contingent perfection cannot itself be devoid of that perfection and goodness of the reality of that perfection and goodness therefore when the necessary being apprehends or knows himself okay when he apprehends his essence by his essence for his essence okay so he knows himself or uh, he perceives himself as as absolute perfection or absolute beauty okay that is why for the philosophers the necessary being is khair mahad okay or pure good okay he is 
he is kamal al matlaq okay the absolute perfection in his essence that is he is not something that becomes perfect okay or he is not a reality in relation to which perfection uh, is accidental or aradi okay he is the very reality of perfection in his essence okay so when the necessary being uh, uh, that is the first identification or the tajalli avval or the tayyun avval of the essence it occurs uh, due to self love that is uh, the essence's love for itself and is therefore the identification and the theophany of self disclosure uh, it is also called tayyun ilmi whereby the essence apprehends or knows itself through itself and for itself now this station being the second level of divinity is known as the plane of divine unity or the maqam al ahadiyya and the station of comprehensiveness or maqam al jam al jam at the plane of divine unity the essence is considered together with the names and attributes albeit the names and attributes at the plane of divine unity that is the maqam al ahadiyya are identical to the essence they are ain dhat and not distinct and separate therefrom okay can everyone hear me yes yes, yes. yes. and by continue okay. now this is therefore Uh, the station of the negatively conditioned existence or wujud bishartila the plane of divine unity merely in consideration that is only in at the bar not not in reality not essentially now w- w- what we are trying to say over here is that first we spoke about the uh, you know the station of the essence or the maqam al dat attributes okay that is the essence is is considered in itself without taking into consideration the names and attributes of the essence okay this is therefore the station of the negatively conditioned existence or wujud bishartila now the plane of divine unity is distinct from the plane of the essence merely in consideration uh, in not not in reality it, it is merely an atbari distinction in the mind but in reality the two stations that is the maqam adat and the maqam ahadiya they are one okay it uh, the essence uh, without taking into consideration his names and attributes okay that is uh, 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 in an un- a conditioned manner okay so uh, we're we're talking about the station of the essence or the maqam adat but when we consider the essence together with all its names and attributes of perfection albeit in such a manner that these uh, attributes these names are not distinct from one another that is not ontologically distinct from one another uh, 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 but are identical to one another and to the essence as well so that is a station of ahadiya also known as the the, the maqam al jam al jam now uh with res- if if the plane of the essence is the interior with respect to the plane of divine unity then the latter is the exterior or the zahir with respect to the former that is to say that the plane of divine unity is the detailed or tafsili manifestation of the plane of the essence which with respect to the plane of divine unity is more comprehensive or ijmal all the attributes present at the station of divine unity desire their distinct entifications and manifestations separate from the essence and the other attributes this is rendered possible by the emanation from the plane of divine unity of the holiest emanation also called the faith al aqdas it is through the mediation of the holiest emanation that the plurality of the divine names and attributes is realized at the plane of the divine oneness that is the maqam al wahidiyah now this maqam al wahidiyah is distinct from uh, the, the station that precedes it that is the maqam al ahadiyah now this maqam al wahidiyah is the third level of divinity and is also called the maqam al jam the station of divine oneness is the exterior of the station of divine unity okay that is the maqam al wahidiyah uh the maqam al wahidiyah is the exterior the zahir of the maqam al ahadiyah and the maqam al ahadiyah just as the station of the essence the maqam al dat uh can you hear me yes yes 
Yeah, just as the station of the essence of the maqam al dat is the interior of interiors, it is the batan of the wahidi, and the wahidi is the exterior. The station of divine oneness is the, I was saying that it, it is the exterior of the station of divine unity, and the station of divine unity is the interior of the station of oneness. The plurality found in the contingent of the divine names and attributes. That is to say that the plurality of the divine names and attributes, that is the kasrat of the asma wal sifat ilahiya, is the basis, okay, due to which there is plurality in the contingent realm of existence. Now, this, uh, uh, this is realized at the plane of divine oneness. The names and attributes that exist at the plane of divine oneness desire further entification and are thus entified as the fixed entities or the ayan al tabita. These fixed ent entities are the forms of the divine names and attributes, the suar al atma, asma wal, wal sifat ilahiya, that exists at the plane of divine oneness. That is to say that the fixed entities are the divine names and attributes entified or rendered delimited. In other words, when the divine names and attributes present at the plane of divine oneness reveal themselves, they do so in the form of the fixed entities. Hence the principle, that is the mabda, or the source of the fixed entities are the divine names and attributes present at the plane of divine oneness. These fixed entities exist in the divine presence of knowledge, also called the Hadrat al-Ilmiya, with an existence okay, uh, that is ontologically more intense than both external and mental existence. Now, for the Urafa, uh, external and mental, besides external existence and besides mental existence, there is a third form of existence as well. In fact, there are, there are form, uh, forms of existence for the Urafa. And the Ayan al-Tabita, uh, uh, exists with an existence uh, called the wujud al-ilmi, okay, since they are forms of divine knowledge. So they do not exist with external existence, nor, the, nor, nor do they exist with, uh, uh, you know, mental existence or wujud the zahni uh, They exist with wujud al-ilmi. Wujud al-ilmi is more ontologically intense and perfect than both wujud -e -kharaj, kharaj and wujud -e zahni the fixed entities desire external manifestation and concrete realization that is accomplished through the mediation of the sacred emanation or the faith -e muqaddas also known as the breath of the merciful the nafs al rahman the self unfolding existence the uh, or wujud al mumbasit the matter of matters the maddatul mawad and God's absolute act, the fail al matlaq, that permeates all things. It is through this self unfolding existence and the sacred emanation that the essence encompasses all reality. As is stated by the Imam, he is with everything but not in the sense of physical proximity. This statement can be found in Nahjul Balaga. I think it is probably in the first sermon. Therefore, if Everything that exists in the contingent worlds is merely a manifestation of the divine names and attributes. Uh, that is to say that nothing can be realized in existence without the mediation of the divine names and attributes. As is stated by the Imam uh, in uh, one of his duas, I think it is probably a dua kumel, and by your names, the asma, which have filled the foundations or the arkan of all things, you know, kulli shay. So, uh, everything that we experience, that we observe, that we experience, that we, uh, you know, uh, that, that is found in the contingent realm of existence is merely an identification, or, you know, one of the tayunat, or uh, basically a theophany, a tajalli, or a manifestation, a madhar of, uh, you know, one or more of the divine names and attributes. Okay, nothing can be realized in in existence. Okay, with without being a manifestation from an ontological perspective of the divine names and attributes. Okay, and these uh, uh, these divine names and attributes, uh, basically the ayan uh, tabita, are the forms of the divine names and attributes. Okay, they are the uh, exterior. Okay, of the divine names and attributes, the dahir. And the divine names and attributes that exist at the maqam al wahidiya okay, which is the uh, maqam of uh, wujud bishar uh, they, they, they are the interior or the batin of the fixed entities, that is the ayan al-tabita. And uh, 
the divine, the plurality of the divine names and attributes at the Maqam al wahidiya also known as the Maqam al for, 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 for some Urufa, although there is a dispute over here between the mystics, between the Urufa, for, for some Urufa, the Maqam al or the station of the cloud, is the uh, maqam ahadiyya and for certain others it is the maqam al wahidiyya so uh, the maqam al wahidiyya itself okay and the maqam al wahidiyya let, let me reiterate it is a station uh, well, uh, that is when, when the essence is considered together with all its names and attributes in such a manner that these names and attributes are not identical to the essence but ontologically distinct and separate from both the essence as well as from one another so that station is called the maqam wahidiya okay so the maqam wahidiya is the dahir or the exterior of the of the maqam or the station preceding it that is the maqam ahadiya now the maqam ahadiya as i've you know just explained earlier it is it is a station that is when the essence is considered uh, together with all its names and attributes of perfection, albeit in such a manner that these names and attributes of perfection are identical, ontologically identical, or the, or the same uh, to one another, as well as to the essence. So that that is known as the maqam ahadiya, also known as the maqam al jam al jam. Okay, or for certain orifa, uh, for some orifa, this station that is the maqam ahadiya, which is the first tajalli or the first tayun, is also the maqam al ama. Okay, and obviously the station preceding it is the station of the essence, the maqam al dat or you know that is the asl al haqiqat al wujud, or uh, the station of wujud la bishat. Okay, yeah. There's a question here that if unity is the principle of all existence and unification is the principle then why would these divine names and these divine knowledge forms, why would they require uh, individual existence or individual substantiation that is uh, separate from, from a place of unity? Uh, Elias, the question sounds really very good, but I need to understand your question. I I haven't been able to understand the question yet. Can would it be possible for you to restate it? Yes, yes. So if if unity is something that is desirable, right? Unity yeah, yeah, and unification yeah. in your existence is something desirable. Then yes, yes. Why would these uh, divine knowledge forms or these divine names, right? Why would yeah. they require or why would they desire something, uh, an, an individual uh, existence or the, an existence that is separate from this unity uh, in, oh. in our base metaphysics? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I understand the question now. That is why uh, if, if wahda or unity is something that is more perfect than plurality, that is ontologically nobler than plurality, then why uh, would the divine names you know, desire to manifest themselves in the form of contingent beings, contingent realities, that is substances and accidents? Uh, is that your question, if I've understood it properly? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Uh, the, the thing over here is, according to the philosophers, that is the hukma and the philosopher, they uh, you know distinguish between the asfal and the ali. Okay, that is the nobler uh, beings or the nobler contingents and the inferior contingents. Now, for, for from the perspective of the philosophers or the hukma, and also from the perspective of the orafa, the uh, the ali. Yeah, you know, uh, beings or you know the the nobler beings are the uh, are the ones that are separate and detached from matter and material properties or uh, attributes. That is the immaterial. That is the necessary being, the first cause, uh, first, and then uh, the separate immaterial intellects or the okule mujarada, and also the uh, the beings that inhibit the imaginal realm or the intermediate realm of uh, Barzakh or the al alam -e mithal So these are the Ali or the nobler existence. And the beings that are found in the f physical world are the Asfal or they, they are from amongst the Safilin. Okay, why? Because they are uh, they belong, you know, uh, uh, they are mixed with matter. They're not detached from matter. 
and they, uh, uh, you know, uh, are subject to time, space, uh, you know, they are limited, they are finite, they are mutable, et cetera, et cetera. So for the philosophers, the nobler does not act for the sake of the uh, less nobler, uh, th that is the inferior, okay? Uh, because every cause, every efficient cause, uh, every cause of existence or perfect cause is nobler and has a higher you know, status uh, in an ontological sense than its effect. And it does not act for the sake of or to, you know, uh, to provide some sort of a benefit to uh, its effect, that is the inferior contingent. But, but having said that, this does not mean that his action or that uh, his being an agent does not benefit the inferior, okay? But the only thing uh, to consider over here is that the uh, nobler or the superior does not act for the sake of the inferior. In fact, the nobler always acts for the sake of itself, you know, I, uh, either for the sake of itself or for the sake of that which is nobler than itself. That is, if it is a contingent being, right, uh, a contingent cause, so it, it, it acts both for itself as well as for the sake of or, you know, for manifesting uh, its cause. Uh, right, but it does not act for the sake of the inferior. So when the divine names desire to manifest themselves, they do not desire to manifest themselves for the sake of their effects, that is the contingent realities. This desire to manifest is uh, a natural and ontological desire, okay? It, it is natural for them, and they do, they desire this uh, for the sake of themselves and for the sake of their principle, okay, which is which is God, the necessary in itself. They they don't desire this for the sake of the inferior, for the sake of uh, that which is, uh, for the sake of the plurality that exists in the contingent realm, but for the sake of the principle of unity. And after the our discussion on you know the ontology of God. Is it that Ibn Arabi believes that the material universe is directly emanated from God, or is his view the same as uh, the Hukama, that there are intellects and then there is the material universe that is eternal? So, uh, oh, yes. Uh, the view of uh, Sheikh Al Akbar, uh, without any doubt whatsoever, is uh, uh, consistent with. Uh, uh, with the view held by the uh, philosophers, that is the uh, Hokama and the uh, uh, you know uh, the, the philosophers, basically. But yes, now obviously, uh, it, the, the thing is that when you're seeking to read Ibn Arabi, most people, you know, they they, they hear the name Ibn Arabi. And and they, they start with the Futuhat, okay, or the Fusus. No, that is not how you how you how you approach you know these these difficult subjects with these these great philosophers or thinkers. Uh, in order to be able to read Ibn Arabi, you would have to read uh, you know uh, a bunch of other great you know classical thinkers you know and uh, and philosophers and mystical philosophers you know uh, in order to develop within yourself the ability to properly you know uh, comprehend what what Ibn Arabi uh, is trying to say, uh, and then f uh, uh, even then you cannot read Ibn Arabi in isolation. Okay, you you would have to take into consideration uh, the other members of his school that are his disciples and his commentators. That is his uh, Sharihin. Okay, so you would have to read uh, people like you know Konabi uh, uh, and Abdul Razak Kashani and Dawood Al Qasri, Abdul Rahman Jami, Fakhruddin Iraqi, Azizuddin Nasafi, Mahmoud Shibistri. Okay, so uh, uh, you you cannot simply pick up a book of Ibn Arabi, read it, and then start you know uh, uh, claiming that you're an expert on Ibn Arabi. No, that is not how it works. Okay, because Ibn Arabi is uh, one of the most difficult, okay, and arguably uh, the most difficult and sophisticated of all the Islamic philosophers. Therefore, his works ought to be approached with the reverence that they deserve, okay? 
and uh, they need to be approached through, through the proper uh, channels or intermediaries. So uh, if you if you go through those intermediaries, if you go through the proper channels, such as you know, if you read the works of uh, Dawud al Qasri, now Dawud al Qasri is basically uh, the student, the disciple of Abdul Razak uh, Kashani. Okay, and uh, da Dawud al Qasri has this great, uh, you know, a very detailed and voluminous commentary on Ibn Arabi's Fusus. So uh, the, he says, uh, you know, uh, in the Muqaddimah uh, to that commentary, uh, that uh, uh, this uh, this is because the first intellect is essentially originated. It, it is Hadith al-Zati, whereas the reality <clears throat> of his knowledge, that is the knowledge of God, is eternal. It is Qadim. Since he is identical with it, that is the essence of God, is identical with his eternal knowledge. So for the Orafa, for Ibn Arabi and his disciples, the divine attributes are not distinct uh, concrete realities. They are not concrete realities that are ontologically distinct from the divine essence. In fact, for the Urafa, uh, these realities, the, uh, the, uh, that is the divine attributes, are identical to the essence. Okay, and this is precisely the belief held by the philosophers, the Hukama. So, uh, since he continues, he says that since uh, his eternal knowledge uh, is identical to his essence. How can how can his knowledge be identical to the first intellect? Now this is the question that he asks. The first intellect being uh, being that it is contingent and originated is preceded by essential non-being. Essential non-being. Okay, he does not say temporal non-being. He says essential non-being. Admal dati, and known only by God, since whatever is not known cannot be endowed with existence. So, uh, Dawud al Qasri believes in the first intellect, and obviously, since the first contingent is an intellectual substance, right? So, therefore, an intellectual substance uh, can only be an intellect if it is devoid of matter and material properties and attributes, and it is uh, and is transcend transcendent in its character. That is, it is it lies beyond both time and space and change. Okay, and that which is not subject to change cannot be temporally originated. For otherwise, it would be a contradiction in terms. So he says that the first intellect is originated. It is hadith. But what kind of hadith? But now, now the, the Urafa and the philosophers distinguish between the essentially originated and the temporally originated, unlike the mutakallimun, for whom the originated simply has one specific meaning, that is the temporally originated, or the hadith al-damani. But for the Urafa and the philosophers, the originated is either essentially originated, okay, uh, is uh, the originated can be essentially originated and temporally originated okay the it is not necessary for the essentially originated to be temporally originated as well uh, albeit the temporally uh, originated is necessarily essentially originated as well okay by essentially originated we mean everything that is preceded by another the masbuk Bil -ghair. Now, this masbuk bil could be, uh, is its uh, the, is the cause of its existence. Okay, the illat uh, al of this thing of the essentially originated, right? By temporally originated, we mean everything that is uh, preceded by a period of non-existence. Okay, so it is masbuk bil zaman, right? So uh, this was Dawud al Qasri, and. Uh, as is evident from from this text that I just read out, of, you know, from Kasri's uh, uh, Sharh of Fusus, the first intellect is essentially originated, as opposed to being temporally originated. It is therefore posterior to essential non-being, masbuk bil admal dati, as opposed to being posterior to temporal non-being, or masbuk bil admal damani. And that which is merely essentially originated is temporally eternal, qadim al zamani, albeit it is not essentially eternal as i as i you know just repeated uh, above uh, which is the attribute of god alone now being essentially eternal or qadim al dati that that is the attribute of god alone so sometimes when the orafa says that god alone is qadim so by that they mean qadim al dati so obviously bo both for the philosophers and the orafa 
Okay, if you're talking about in a dhati sense, so the word qadim or eternal can only uh, be used in you know for God. It cannot be used for anything contingent, even if that contingent happens to be uh, does not happen to be temporally originated. Okay, but so if you're talking about uh, in an essential sense, in a zati sense, so the word qadim would only apply to the necessary in itself. Okay, only God is Qadim in this sense. Everything everything else is Hadith. So uh, the same is also true for the other immaterial intellects, okay, that, that emanate from the first cause through the mediation of the first intellect in that they are essentially originated, uh, but temporally eternal. That is the immaterial intellects are not temporally originated, okay? Uh, this is... Obviously, contrary to the doctrine of the, uh, you know, the, the Mutakallimun, uh, particularly the Asharite and the Maturidi theologians, who believe the cosmos in its entirety to be temporally originated in an absolute sense, okay? Uh, because for the Mutakallimun, there was nothing, uh, okay? And I mean, literally mean nothing, okay? And then uh, the world basically emerged into existence. Now, uh, uh, I'm going to read another statement from, uh, you know, Kaisari's Sharhe of Fusus. Uh, this statement is also from his Muqaddama, from a different part of the Muqaddama. So he says that, uh, know that the names of the acts are subdivided in accordance with their governing uh, uh, properties. That is the Asma'i Fail. There are some names whose governance is never discontinued, whose effects are infinite, pre-eternally, and post-eternally, that is both Adali and Abadi, such as the names governing the Holy Spirits, that is the immaterial intellects, the angelical souls, and everything that, although originated, that is, although Hadith, is not within time, Zaman, but within perpetuity, Dahar. Okay, so it couldn't be more obvious and more explicit than this, I believe, okay, that uh, he's saying explicitly, explicitly that the immaterial intellects, and uh, since they are intellectual substances, so they are they lie beyond time, okay, beyond motion, okay, and since they transcend motion and change and are therefore immutable, uh, hence they cannot be subject to time because time is the measure of change or measure of gradual change of motion. Okay, so this was uh, uh, Daoud al. Kaisari. Now, as per Kaisari's statement, uh, the effects of certain divine names are infinite, pre-eternal, and post-eternal, uh, such as the uh, immaterial intellects and the angelical souls. Now, this is another statement, you know, from Kaisari's Muqaddama that I'm going to read right now uh, for everyone. The truth of the matter that is self-evident for every fair-minded person is that he who originated everything and brought forth its existence from non-being, whether it be from temporal non-being, Admal Damani, or non-temporal non-being, Admal Ghayral Damani, knows these things by their realities and concomitant forms, mental and external, before bringing them into existence. Therefore, it would not have been possible to endow them with existence as such. Thus, his knowledge of them is another thing. Kaisari in the above statement distinguishes uh, in this statement, that the, the one that I just read out, he distinguishes between temporal non-being and non-temporal non-being. So there is, for Kaisri, there is Adme Zamani, and then there is Adme Ghayl Zamani. The former, okay, that is the Adme Zamani, applies to things that exist within time, okay, Fi Zaman, and are temporally originated, uh, that is Hadith Al Zamani, and are posterior to temporal non being, Masbuk Bil Admal Damani. Whereas the latter, that is Adme Ghayr Al Damani, applies to beings that do not exist within time, such as the immaterial intellects and are therefore not temporally originated, but temporally eternal, albeit they are essentially originated, as has already been discussed above. So uh, then there is Abdul Razak Kashani, you know, the Qaisuri's uh, master, okay, his sheikh. So Kashani states that the, the, the eternal is spoken of in two ways. The first is the existent that is dependent upon another for its existence. And this is the eternal in itself, okay, Qadim al -Dati. Okay, uh, the first is the existence that is not dependent upon another for its existence, and this is the eternal in itself, the Qadim al -Dati. And two, the other is an existence that is not posterior 
to temporal non-being and is not non-existent in any period of time. And the eternal in this sense is the temporally eternal, the Qadim al-Damani. And the originated is spoken of, is spoken in opposition to the above mentioned eternities. That is the essentially originated, meaning that which depends upon another for its existence, and the temporally originated, meaning that which is posterior to temporal non-existence. And time is not temporally originated, since it is not possible for there to be a time before time, in which time itself is non-existent. For in that case, time would both be and not be, albeit time is originated in the first sense, with essential origination, or hudut al dati This is from, uh, this was uh, Abdul Razak Kashani. He states this in, in a very, uh, you know, beautiful work of his called Mabda wal Maad, The Origin and the Return, in the eighth chapter, or the eighth fasl of uh, the Mabda wal Maad. And then there is uh, Azizuddin Nasafi. So, you know, there is a long list of Ibn Arabi's disciples who, who are basically all saying the same thing. Uh, uh, Azizuddin Nasafi, you know, the, there is a statement of his, he says that, know that the wise differ on whether it is possible for non-existence to become existence and for existence to become non-existence. The scholars and the jurists believe that it is possible for non-existence to become existence and for existence to become non-existence because the cosmos was first non-existent and then was subsequently made to exist by God. And he would later render it non-existent when he so wills it. The philosophers and the folk of unity, that is the Orofa, believe that it is impossible for non-existence to become existence, okay? And for existence to become non-existence. Non-existence would always remain non-existence and existence was always existence. However, it is possible for existence to move from one grade to another and from one state to another. Uh, and from one form to another. Individual things, when combined together, become composites, and composites disintegrate into individuals, and the masses, having witnessed this transition, erroneously think that non-existence becomes existence, and existence becomes non-existence. This is from Azizuddin Nasafi's Maqsa de Aqsa, uh, the, the fasl, it is from the seventh fasl, and uh, the, the, the first para. So Nasafi's statement, uh, the impossibility for non-existence to become existence, as mentioned above, uh, implies the negation on the part of the philosophers, of uh, the philosopher and the folk of uh, unity, that is the Orofa, of the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, or the temporal origination of the world in an absolute sense, affirmed by the, by the, by the scholars, that is the ulama and the jurists, the fuqaha, as is apparent from the following part, uh, of the statement that I'm going to read out. The, the scholars and the jurists believe that it is possible for non-existence to become existence and for existence to become non-existence because the cosmos was first non-existent and then was subsequently made to exist yeah. by God. And he would later uh, render you guys wish me to continue when he so a bit, you know. Therefore, for Nasafi, the philosophers and the mystics believe the cosmos not to be temporally originated in an absolute sense. Okay, sure, sure, sure. So, uh, I was mentioning Jami, he says that as, as for the Sufis, may God sanctify their souls, they allowed the dependence of an eternal effect on a free agent and combined affirmation of the agent's free choice with belief in the existence of an eternal effect. So they said, clear mystical revelation has shown that if a thing necessitates an entity through its essence rather than through a condition superadded to its essence, which is what is called the other, or ghair, or if that thing includes one or more conditions which are identical with its essence, such as relations and attributions, then it continues necessitating that entity, which is its effect, and it endures with it as long as its essence endures as, for example, the most exalted pen, or Qalam al-A'la, for it was the very first thing created, there being no intermediary or wasta between it and its creator. And it endures as long as its creator endures. Okay? It is as if they had adhered to what uh, al-Amidi said, to the effect 
that the priority of bringing into existence by intention qasdan to the existence of the effect is just like the priority of bringing into existence by necessity just as the priority of uh, uh, just as the priority of necessary bringing into existence is an essential rather than a temporal priority so also is it possible here for intentional bringing into existence to be contemporaneous with the thing intended but to be prior to it in essence in this way it is possible for a certain existent to be necessarily existent from eternity through the necessary existent in himself even though he is a free agent thus the two are contemporaneous although they differ with respect to essential priority and posteriority just as the movement of the hand is essentially prior to the movement of the ring even though it is contemporaneous with it so this was abdur rahman jami molana abdur rahman jami from al dur al fakhira <coughs> so so yes i mean like as is evident from jami statement and uh, uh, from the statement of the rest of the or of uh, belong to the school of you know ibn arabi the proximate effects of the necessary being are the necessary consequences of his essence and are therefore his eternal effects being merely essentially a posterior to him not temporally posterior the statement shared you know uh, over here uh, ought to be sufficient for the removal of any veils of doubt or ignorance from the, from the side of anyone who is uh, truly sincere in his quest and search for the truth uh, but obviously for the inherently blind and insincere uh, you know nothing would suffice sanbe there is one more question like uh, what if someone claims that these uh, interpreters or commentators of uh, Sheikh Al Akbar these people were actually affected by the views of Falasifa and Fukama and due to this they had an essential bias to try to uh, interpret his works in accordance with the views of uh, Falasifa and in reality they had a be Sheikh Al Akbar was not trying to say this so how how would one argue against this claim or say or present some argument against it well obviously i mean one who one who makes such a claim would need to first of all substantiate his claim because there is already you know uh, so much material in the sheikh's works itself you know that the, through which we can easily substantiate uh, what these disciples are trying to say okay so it's not that you know this material only exists in the works of his uh, commentators and disciples no you, we can find the same ideas the same notions the same concepts in the works of the uh, uh, of the sheikh himself okay so uh, in the futuhat al makkiyah in the fusus and in the other works of the sheikh uh you can you know just as easily find the same thing over there naturally from where else are these disciples bringing all these things okay they are basically trying to elaborate and trying to explain uh in philosophical terms in in a more technical you know language uh, what the sheikh has tried uh, what the sheikh has stated in his works okay which are not that uh, uh, which are not philosophical in the sense uh, let's say uh, avicenna's works or farabi's works or mulla sadra's you know uh, uh, works are f- uh, philosophical so the disciples of ibn arabi took it upon themselves you know to uh, uh, provide philosophical commentaries and explanations of the statements of the sheikh and uh, yeah this name by uh, someone asked a question from the audience so this one in the mention it so you can answer it inshallah yeah so they're asking the problem about the unity of god and the multiplicity within the universe is solved but how does it uh, does his philosophy matter his philosophy resolve the superimposed duality in a relationship between god and his creation you know there's a duality and multiplicity within the creation how does his philosophy resolve that uh, i sorry uh, uh, as can you repeat the question again sure. i didn't actually get the question the problem uh, so it's in how does it matter his philosophy resolve the superimposed duality in the relationship between god and his creation Okay, I think what they are trying to ask is that how does Ibn Arabi's philosophy uh, yeah. it actually introduces these intellects, right? So it is actually creating a distance between the creation, uh, the the material universe and God. 
so how how would you solve this problem and why is it not problematic i think that's what they are trying to ask no i uh, i still uh, i'm sorry i still, still didn't get the question i mean like uh, is is that really the question is, uh, but the thing is that uh, ibn arabi is not seeking to eliminate duality in an absolute sense that is okay he is merely saying that uh, there is only one thing that exists in the true sense and by that he means uh, the necessary in itself because the only independent reality that exists bil istiqlal that is in a zati sense is is god it is it is the reality of existence the asl al haqiqat al wujud okay or the wujud la bishart okay that is the only reality uh, that exists uh, in the true sense so he is the mawjood e haqiqi or the wujood e haqiqi everything else is wujood e majazi okay not majazi in 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 a linguistic or a literal sense but in, in an irfani or a mystical sense okay since everything else is basically a theophany or a manifestation or a madhhar okay or a ray okay from the the luminosity of uh, or, you know uh, of the divine basically so there is nothing nothing else exists when we say nothing when they say nothing else exists by that they mean there there is only one necessary in itself okay so there is no other when they negate the existence of any other besides god or besides the reality of existence so by that they mean that uh, god or the reality of existence is the only uh, independent absolutely independent reality absolutely self sufficient reality that there could be that there is okay and that that there ever was there would uh, there would be no other thing no other reality that could exist or that could be okay that could that could ex- exist in the same sense and manner as uh, the reality of existence or as the necessary in itself because everything uh, everything that exists besides the necessary save the necessary in itself is basically a, a derived reality it derives its reality its perfection its goodness its luminosity its light okay to you uh, to use you know uh, a more ishrati language from the reality of existence so it's basically a manifestation an entification a tayyun or Uh, a ray of that reality a shaun or, or a tatawur of that reality no, okay but not that reality itself so that that is how they resolve uh, you know uh, plurality reduce plurality into unity um could you please elaborate uh, sheikh ibn arbi's uh, ibarat of fazan what he really meant uh, mostly f- uh, fasos sorry which ibara uh, uh, the, the the terminology ibn arbi uses for faz- fazan as fazan okay 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 yeah 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 so uh Uh, basically for the orafa uh the faz is basically a th- the tayun or the tanazzul uh, of uh, the reality of existence that is when the reality of existence uh by by the sheer perfection of its essence and the abundance of uh, its essential goodness it basically pours forth and it overflows so naturally it, it it can only flow downward so the reality of existence that is uh, it's it's rays it's uh, you know uh, they they basically descend downwards okay and this descent is is basically the phase okay that the, the through which the all the other realities that is the divine names and attributes at the at the station of the uh, wah, uh, wahidiya the ayan thabita uh, at the station of the uh, you know uh, d- divine uh, presence that is the hazrat al ilmiya and uh, the wujud al mumbasat uh, mumbasat or the fayd al muqaddas and then the entire contingent realm beginning with the uh, the intelligible world and then the imaginal realm okay and then the material realm the sensible world okay so all all these realities all these distinct ontological realities or the haqaiq are basically uh, realized into existence due to this this the due to the uh, the overflowing or the pouring forth 
of uh, the, the, you know the, the the abundance of divine goodness, which is which is his essential goodness and and perfection. So the first. Uh, the holiest emanation, that is the Fed, the first thing that emanates from uh, the divine essence, or uh, it would be more appropriate to say from the Ta'yune Avval or the Tajalliya Avval, which is the Makame Ahadiya, the first thing that emanates from the Makame Ahadiya, uh, which is merely distinct from the Makame Dat, uh, you know, uh, in consideration that is in Atabar, but not essentially not in reality. So the first thing, the first reality that emanates is called the Fed al Akdas. Okay, now the exterior of the Fed al Akdas for the Urafa is the Isme Azam al Jame Allah. Okay, so if you want to see the Fad al Akdas, if you want to observe or experience its Zahir, so it is the Isme Azam al Jame Allah, which is, which is the Isme Dat of, of God, the most comprehensive uh, divine name. And if you want to see the interior of the Isme Azam al Jame Allah, so you, uh, that is the Fad al Akdas, or the, or the holiest emanation. Okay, so the Ithme Adam al Jame Allah uh, uh, is is the source or the masdar from which basically emanate the rest of the divine names and attributes in a, in the form of a uh, of a plurality in a, in a distinct ontologically distinct form, and this is the station of the uh, Wahidiya basically. Okay, and uh, and then the, these names. Uh, you know, uh, are further identified. Uh, they, they, they get they get more mutayun. So the tayunat of these names are the forms of the divine names and attributes. So the surah asma wa sifat, uh, which are basically the ayane tabita or the fixed uh, eternal archetypes of the fixed entities. Now these ayane tabita are further. Uh, uh, the 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 the, the agdas basically. Uh, it has uh, its own manifestation, uh, which is uh, which is the Fayd Muqaddas or the Wujud Mumbasit or the Nafs al Rahman, or Fail Matlaq, or Mashiat Failia, or Maddatul Mawad. All these are, you know, uh, distinct names of the same reality. This reality is uh, 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 basically the source of the first or the noblest contingent uh, from from a mystical perspective okay from a phil from a philosophical perspective the first uh, the first thing created by god or the first reality that emanates from the essence of the divine is the first intellect which is an intellectual substance that is devoid of matter and material attributes and is transcendent in its character uh, you know transcending both the, the the limitations of both space and time but for the mystics for the orafa the first reality that that basically uh, uh, you know uh, the, the first reality is neither uh, uh, it's it, it's not an intellectual substance it is not the first intellect it is it is the self unfolding existence or the wujud the mumbasit or nafs rahman okay or uh, the madatul mawad or uh, you know mashiat afelia or fele matlaq and the first intellect is basically uh, the manifestation or the first identification of of this self unfolding existence okay and uh, uh, yeah so all these realities are basically the product of uh, the divine faith or the divine effusion yes Yes, uh, does anyone else have any questions? I think um, I had a question. Uh, he asked him to ask. So he was saying that... Uh, uh, Elias yeah. answered it. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, okay. you, you can still mean. ask it. Yeah, uh, no, my question was... Um, How exactly did uh, Sheikh uh, Sheikh Al Akbar uh, reconcile Wahdat al Wujud with the uh, multiplicity in the material realm? Did he go through the method of Tashkik uh, al Wujud, or did he believe in something else? Yeah, I I think uh, 
Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question and a very significant one, but I think I've just uh, spoken, uh, you know, uh, I've just answered this question when I said that uh, for the sheikh, uh, the only thing that exists, okay, and by, by, by existence over here, we mean essential existence, that is existing in an essential manner, that is in itself, not, not in a derivative sense. So the only thing that truly exists is the divine. It is a divine being that is being qua being or wujud bimah or wujud or asl al haqiqat al wujud. That is the only reality that exists. Okay, so so that is the unity of being the the wahdat al wujud, wa wahdat al mawjud. So there is only one one wujud and there is only one mawjud. But this does not negate or, or is not or it is not uh, you know contrary to or in conflict with in any manner whatsoever with the, the plurality of ex existence that we experience, okay? That is the kasrat al-wujud wal-mawjud, okay? Because wahdat uh, al-wujud wal-mawjud is the ain kasrat al-wujud wa kasrat al-mawjud. So uh, because the plurality that we experience, that we observe, or, uh, you know, uh, that we experience through mystical insight or, you know, and disclosure, the, all these realities, all these haqqaiq, are basically the you know they, they do not exist in a real sense okay they exist in a majazi sense okay uh, how shall i put it in a, in a metaphorical sense okay now when i say majazi i do not mean uh, in 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 the, in the, in the linguistic or literal sense but but i mean it in in the in a mystical sense okay so this is majazi irfani so they exist in a majazi sense because their reality is a derived reality. They are basically quir quirities uh, or that are bestowed existence by another. Okay. Now this other, that is the bestower of existence, with, uh, who is the, who, uh, he is the benefactor, and these quirities are the beneficiary. They receive or they derive this, this, the, the luminosity or the light of existence from another. In themselves, they are all dark. Okay. They are all. Uh, they're nothing but, you know, uh, essential zulma, okay? So they're all uh, dark. Uh, they don't have anything of their own. Whatever goodness and perfection or whatever light that they have, this is a borrowed or a, a derived light. They're simply reflecting something that does not belong to them essentially, but is but has been given to them by another, okay? And this bestower, he is light, uh, in his essence, he is goodness and perfection and existence in his essence. So existence is beauty. It is goodness. It is perfection. It is the reality of light. Okay, that is why uh, Sheikh al Ishraq in his Hikmat al Ishraq and the other works and even the Orafa they they uh, they call the necessary being the Nurul Anwar. Okay, the the light of lights. Okay, because he's the principle of all of all lights okay every other contingent light is basically a ray uh, from among you know the rays of his light okay so uh, in that sense okay you can reconcile plurality with unity we can end the session yes if, an, if anyone else has any question they, they can ask and otherwise we can end the session I, I don't think. Let me just see if uh, someone else asks a question. Shahriyar is saying something about the divine planes, but he has not specified what his question is. We have extensively okay. talked about divine planes. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, in yeah. great detail. Yes, I. Yeah, so I, I, I think we can just end by yeah, saying a yeah. few words about uh, 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 about uh, the phenomenon of, you know, takfir on Ibn Arabi and how many people have, you know, criticized him and called him various things. So often when we talk about uh, in, in any such session or in any space when we talk about the metaphysics of uh, Ibn Arabi, uh, people do bring up these references, and uh, if you see that these references are mostly from 
and not even from people who studied their own aqida who studied their own creed but rather from people who were jurists or who were you know uh fuqaha so uh, should we consider the critique of these people or uh, even nowadays we are seeing people who are calling this whole uh, view of hukama and urafa kufar so how how should one deal with it and what what is your advice for audience and for those people who are uh, uh, doing takfir on this yeah this is a very good question uh the thing is that most most of the people who are basically you know uh, criticizing uh, you know the philosophers and the urafa and uh sheikh al akbar ibn arabi and his disciples or uh, uh, uh sheikh rais ibn sina and farabi and uh, uh you know the the other hukama and the philosophers and uh, opposing their views and doctrines so the, you, you most of these people have not really been able to grasp or have not really been able to properly comprehend and understand you know the ideas or the, the statements of uh, ibn arabi or ibn sina or farabi or mulla sadra you know they uh, uh, in first of all uh, ju- the, the jurists the fuqaha uh, do not have the right they do not have the authority nor the expertise to comment upon uh, matters pertaining to doctrines or beliefs okay because in order to be able to express an opinion or an idea or in order to be able to assert or claim uh or, or make a claim regarding regarding a re, you know some, something uh you need to be you need to first have you know proper knowledge concerning that particular uh subject or that particular you know uh, topic you know that that is under consideration or discussion but uh, these people that is uh, particularly the the fuqaha the jurists they uh, how can they i mean like uh, sometimes i really wonder at their uh, audacity and their boldness how can they you know uh, criticize uh, uh, philosophers and mystics such, such as ibn arabi and ibn sina or mulla sadra without having read a single work you know by these uh, great masters you know you cannot Uh, you uh, with, without having without having understood without having read a single work of ibn sina uh, how can you claim that you know whatever he's saying is invalid or inaccurate or false or is contrary to uh, uh, you know the islamic scriptures you know the the, the theological texts that is the quran and and the sunnah or the statements of the prophet so in order in order to be in order to be able to uh, to say that you you, you should have uh, uh, you know you ought to have read ibn sina's text that is the only way uh you can you can make such a statement in fact you you not only uh, ought to have you know you not only ought to read ibn sina's text but you also should be able to understand what what avicenna is trying to say or what ibn arabi is trying to say uh without without with, without this i mean like uh, their their objections or their critiques or their uh, refutations against uh, these great masters and thinkers they uh, they ought to be ignored straight off exactly exactly so uh, i i think this is a good place to end our discussion now uh zaka last night bhai for giving this uh, extensive talk and my pleasure my pleasure us. my pleasure my okay then then and this wa ma alaina illa al-balagh al-mubin ma salama khuda hafiz khuda hafiz